This is outside uh, the Robert Mondavi Winery in Napa Valley. You can see all the vines up there. Lovely setting, isn't it? December. The harvest is August through November. So after March 30th this year, if there was significant frost, they would point all those fans in the same direction as the prevailing wind. If you could keep the air moving over the top of the new growth, the frost crystals would be less likely to develop on the new growth and hurt the new growth. That's what all those fans are about. But you know what? We haven't needed them for like five years. Because there's no frost after March 1st. But they should have something in place, because if the new growth freezes, it's called shatter and it really affects the yield of the vines that year. Yeah, let's go into the vineyard here. Now, if you look closely at these vines, mm -hmm. I think you can see that we cut them back every year. We prune the vines. All pruning is done to control the yield because you don't want the most grapes you can get. You want a fair amount of grapes of good quality, not a huge amount of grapes of less than great quality. This is called spur pruning. It's pretty popular for Cabernet where we cut everything off except two buds from the previous season. And if you look closely there, you can see that little two bud extension from 2010. Mm -hmm. Now they're go by spur pruning. Most of these vines have eight spurs. They want two shoots to come off each spur. They would like three bunches of grapes to develop on each shoot. Mm -hmm. Now if they were successful at that, it would take two vines to produce eight pounds of grapes. It takes eight pounds of grapes to make one gallon of wine. One gallon of wine would be five bottles. So that's their goal by spur pruning. But you know what? They're seldom successful because it's hard to get plants to do what you want. If you're going to make any type of wine, whether it's Zinfandel or Chardonnay, but you know we're talking Cabernet specifically, it has to be 75% of that grape variety in the bottle to be able to call it by that name. So they do leave you 25% with Cabernet to blend in those other four red grape varieties I'd mentioned to try and craft your wine to the flavor profile that your particular winery is aiming for. Like I just said, our main flavor profile here is approachability. What I mean by approachability are wines that aren't so dry that they change your face for five minutes. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you've all had really dry and good <laughs> wines, but it's pretty much like this. Hey, how's the wine? I love it. You are like contorted with tannins. Mm -hmm. My friends and I say the tannins in the red wines, they knit sweaters on your teeth. But what kind of sweaters? Wool sweaters or cashmere sweaters? It's kind of a different feel for the way the tannin is delivered. Mm -hmm. But what I really mean by approachability are wines that open you up to more flavor experience. Not wines that are beyond dry, that are astringent. They actually deny you flavor experience. That's why when young wines are too dry in that way, they put them away. They sell them. So over time, that dryness will maybe mellow. But like I said, we're all trying to make wines now that are ready to be enjoyed, but will maybe develop 10 years in the bottle. Now you could achieve this flavor profile by blending. But here at Robin Davi Wine, they have such amazing resources here. They're able to grow the same types of grapes, mostly Cabernet, in different situations to get different flavors within the same variety. Now if you look at these vines here, as the shoots have grown up from the spur, they had workers come and guide the shoots through these double fruiting wires halfway up the trellis. So they would attach to the top wire. And then they wanted these vines to grow up. So as all the grapes developed, they were hanging in the sun at the base of the vine. Because wine grapes that ripen in the sun have a certain set of flavors in the finished wines when they come forward. Now deep into the vineyard here, we have a lot of Cabernet vines. We let them grow up, out, and down over the grapes. They let the leaf canopy develop. You know, grapes are heavy. They grow straight down. 
So you have the ability to manipulate the environment they ripen in. By doing this, you can change the flavors that come forward in the finished wine. Roses are very sensitive to mold and mildew. One of the worst problems in wine grapes in Napa Valley is powdery mildew. So if you see mildew on roses, and that's what this is, mildew, you can head it off by sulfur dusting the grapes before they're affected. That would be an organic way to drive the mildew. So the roses are all pretty, but they're kind of like a canary in a coal mine. Mm -hmm. You know, an early warning that this problem might be ahead of the year. We're gonna see a modern basket press when we get inside. I just want you to be able to relate it to this one. Because you know what, the design has not changed that much. This whole wall of grapevines here, it's only four plants. Yep, three of which are coming out of the drains on the ramp. Here's the fourth one right there. They grew these grapes on the wall for insulation. Because during the summer, when all the leaves are out, it keeps the cellar cooler. You know that's very important at a winery to keep it cool? Mm -hmm. So first of all, it's for insulation. Second of all, it's for decoration, because yeah. it's pretty. Yeah. But you know what? The grapes it produces are very nasty. See, they're still on there. This is this year's crop. Last year's crop is still dried up on there. They're so nasty, most of the birds won't eat them. But it looks like that little bird ate a lot of them. He can't mm -hmm. even move. Look at him. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's basking in the sun. These are all olive trees. Olive oil is now the second largest legal export from Napa Valley. The yep. same grape variety, different row direction, different sets of flavors in the finished wine. Oh. Now, it's not just the sun, because you think the leaves mm -hmm. are just turned. It it's actually a different aspect of the sun. So the different aspect creates a different speed of glucose, fructose development in the grapes. The acid recedes at a different rate. Now, as you age these wines for one year in barrels, subtle differences in grape chemistry become bigger differences in the finished wines. Now, the people who make wooden tanks like this for fermentation and wooden barrels for aging, we're going to see a lot of those. The people who make them from wood are called coopers. So the, the product you make, if you're a cooper, is called cooperage. And coopers are like boat builders, but they want to keep the liquid in, not out. But it's some of the same specifications as boat builders. We only use French cooperage here. Although American cooperage is very popular, even in France right now. It just takes 50 years to get a barrel business going for workmanship and reputation. Now, one way to create wines that are ready to be enjoyed young is gentle fruit handling. Not only are all these red grapes out here hand-picked, but they bring them upstairs in these giant elevators. They crush them directly into the tanks from up here. They move the equipment from tank to tank. Pushes the 
about the steps with rubber fingers. See the steps right there? Then it cleans them up a little. Then it tweaks them open gently so the juice and the seeds come out of the skins. The juice, the seeds, and the skins go right into the tank. You can't jacket these tanks to chill them, so they add some dry ice to slow the fermentation down. When you ferment red wine, all the skins come to the top. Because we'll put a lot of the flavor and color are in the skins. So from my experience, red wine making on this scale, this is the most important part of it. Where we pump the juice from the bottom up over the skins. The juice percolates through the skins and it pulls some of the flavor, color, and richness into the wine. There's 56 of these 5,000 gallon French white oak tanks in this room for 56 separate figure books. Check the progress of fermentation by density or specific gravity. That's used during beer fermentation too. Once you drain the liquid wine, the whole reason for pressing the skin is to extract that rich wine that's saturated in the skin. But the technique of pressing is to not crack the seeds. So then if you've been into food seeds, you know how bitter they are. You don't want that bitterness in the wine. But luckily, nature designed grape seeds with some structural integrity. You know, kind of like an egg, but stronger. Now these blending trials go on for months as they're crafting the wine in different combinations. You know, to get it just right. There's eight people in the winemaking team here. They coordinate their diet during the blending trial. So they respond to the wine the same way. I mean, they don't eat the same food, but they have a shopping list. Now here, come a little closer. Mr. Nobby's going to say a few words, but it goes by quickly. Yeah, listen to this. With all the new technology that we have, we are learning how to make our wine with more layers of flavor, more gentle flavor, and all. We have a long ways to go yet. Now he's 90, and he says we have a long ways to go yet. Now, I uploaded this little video about the making of these tanks in France in the 1990s. They told me never to show it because of the production value. I'm, I just kind of let the beginning of it play to show you what they went through to make these tanks. They farmed the oak for these tanks, 200 year crops. The journey of our oak fermentation tanks for the Tokolan project began approximately 180 years ago in the Allier Forest in the center of France. Oak trees are grown for 150 to 200 years. At optimum maturity, they are harvested, split, never sawn, trimmed, and aged for five years in the natural elements of sun, wind, and rain. The lengthy aging is key to having the wood seasoned properly, eliminating any green or sappy character. After this aging process, the lumber is precision milled to the specified length and thickness. The width of each stave is unique, however, based solely on how the splitting of the tree followed the wood's natural grain. French coopers hand assemble each tank using only dowels, hoops, and natural tension to hold it together. Organic reeds are used between each stain to make the tank watertight. Each stain is precisely fit, followed by Look, shaping the tank over the six times just for this project. And the wood. 56 times. The tank is completely constructed by Terenceau Cooperage in Cognac, France. Isn't that something? Hey, see if you can notice that the smells change as we go down. There's different molecules hang at different levels in the cellar. We only use this room 90 days a year for wine production because it's only for fermentation. That's August through November. But the maintenance on this room is 365 days a year. This is not a big money making way to make wine, but it makes some great wine. In fact, the other 80% of the wine making here pays for this. Now when these are half full, or three quarters full of sweet red grape must, that's what they call the crushed red grapes, must. Yeast is the catalyst that turns grape juice into wine. So once you add the yeast, the yeast is voracious. The yeast eats sugar. Uh -huh. The byproducts are heat, 
alcohol and CO2. The CO2 lifts all the skins to the top. It's called the calf. It could be two or three feet thick in these things. The skins on top of the juice. But like you saw in the video, they have those bi-orbital sprinklers distributing the juice evenly. The juice percolates through the skins and it pulls some of the flavor, color, and richness into the wine. Some of the tanks, they'll do it eight hours on, 12 hours off for 10 or 11 days. But some tanks might be six hours on, six hours off. What they're doing is trying to create a, what we call a spice rack or variations within a theme. The theme would be Cabernet Sauvignon. So not only distinction in the ripening environment outside, you know, with the shade ripen, sun ripen, different road direction. Say you took the massive hillside vineyard, you fermented it in seven separate tanks with different pump over formula combinations you're creating variations within the variations. The more variations you create, the more tools you would have to try to blend together to achieve this all-important flavor profile. So this is the first year cellar. You can see what they use the second press line for? They stain wood with it, just so it looks pretty. So this is wine it uses stain on the wood. Just so it looks nice. And does it look nice? You can see here, it's impossible to not to go red wine on barrels, so it looked kind of sloppy, but they don't want to make sloppy wine here. They want to make pretty wine. So every year, this is the 2011 vintage, which just came downstairs last month. What they were trying to say with this artwork, it's the order of the known world and the asymmetry of the spiritual world. So that's what this whole installation is about. Everything at this winery is about art, wine, and food. And these are three subjects that nobody's wrong, right? Let's head to the second year cellar. So once they blend those wines in stainless steel tanks, they move the empty barrels here, they put the blended wine back in the barrels for another year for synergy, back in the barrels for another year for synergy of the blend or cohesive quality, then it goes to bottling. When you bottle wines, they go into molecular shock for three or four months. It's called bottle shock. It's a bad thing. The wines have gel flavors. Here they bottle the wines, they hold them for a whole year just to make sure the bottle shock is over. So it takes three years for our Cabernets to get to the market. Now each of these barrels is 60 gallons of wine. 60 gallons or 25 cases or 300 bottles. All the bottles and other barrels in this room are either $40 a bottle or up, but mostly up. Mostly $135 a bottle. So they make a lot of wine. Not on this wine. They don't. It's just such a careful winemaking process that it's hard to make money on this wine. In fact, like I said, the other 80% of the winemaking here pays for this. Yeah, come this way. This is my favorite part of this winery, this courtyard. I've been at some incredible parties in this courtyard. Some I remember. Mr. Madabi went to Marrake, Italy, modeled this courtyard from which his first parents grew up, came back and recreated it here. Isn't it beautiful? I love it out here. It's my favorite part of the whole winery. Ninety percent of the time, if you approach your wines like this, you'll head up bad wines without tasting them. So whenever anybody hands you a glass of wine, you keep it as still as possible, and you put your nose right in the glass. You can always smell the wine in the distance, then you volatilize the esters, or you create more surface area. Doesn't it make sense? More surface area, it's gonna release yes. your smell, right? Yes. Then you smell it again. You can have a bad wine that easily 90% of the time. Now I thought we'd go through this together with the first wine. So I'd like you to hold off tasting this first wine for a moment if you can. This is what I would like you to do for the rest of your life when anybody knows you a glass of wine. So put your nose in the glass and take a big long full. You smell it, right? Now, now on a flat surface like this, you can really work it. And that's what I want you to do. It's working. Come on, take it around there. Agitate your wine. Don't be afraid to spill on this table. There's been a lot of wine spilled on this table over the years. Come on, take it around there. Now smell it again. Stronger? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is how you could head off a bad wine. It should always smell the same as it did still, only stronger, like this. This next thing, this is what I would like you to take home with you from this experience today. Wine tasting, to me, is a three-sip deal. 
it's flush, calibrate, judge. Or something more memorable would be sip, 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 right? <laughs> sip, sip, sip. Your personal chemistry and the wine chemistry are quite different. Your body does not want to ingest alternative chemistry. And all it reads is pH. So when you introduce a radically different chemistry to your mouth, like alcohol, your taste buds close quickly. Because your body's trying to send you a message. You know, what are you drinking here? That's why sometimes if you go to a party, they hand your first wine of the day, you taste it and you go, ew. But 20 minutes later, you're like, where's the wine? Mm. So I'm here to tell you, try to tell you why that happens. So pick up your glass, take a sip, delay the wine slightly, then swallow it, please. Now, I'm just guessing, wild guess, this is your first wine of the day. Yeah. <laughs> no? Well, good for you. But I've been with you for an hour now, and I know you haven't had wine in that time. So I'm going to get you right back here. Do you feel it? The citrus component, it's kind of clenching a little at the back of your jaws. Do you feel it stimulating saliva production? Mm -hmm. Feel that? Yeah. That's your body trying to dilute the alternative chemistry. You know when the chemistry is so radically different that your body can't immediately identify it? Your body's first natural reaction is dilute and survive. It doesn't know what it is. So your body over secretes. It wants to balance the imbalance, which makes sense. But what I'm seeing you here pretty much don't judge a wine by the first step. Now for the second step, I want you to put your etiquette aside for a minute. I want you to get some wine in your mouth and I want you to move the wine around so it touches every single surface in your mouth. I'll tell you what, let's see if we can do it for four seconds. It's going to be challenging. I'm going to warn you, it's going to be pretty intense. I'm sure this wine is reaching parts of your mouth where no wine is reached today. Now, do you feel it? Mm -hmm. You feel your taste buds tingling? Mm -hmm. Do you know what they're doing? They're trying to adjust to this alternative chemistry. Mm -hmm. Now, this is probably my main point about this whole tasting. When you introduce alternative chemistry like this to your mouth twice, you know what triggers a very basic instinct we have inside ourselves? It's called taste response. Do you know throughout history, Humans have been tasting things once and putting it down, right? Forever, because it was not good, or it was bitter, or it was nasty in some way. That's why it takes two sips of alternative chemistry to trigger taste response. You know, your body doesn't want to waste its time figuring out things it doesn't need to figure out. But at this point, your taste buds suddenly realize it's not a mistake, because it's happening again. And your taste buds realize at this point they better get on board and start dilating and adjusting to this new chemistry. Because do you know what your taste buds are right now? It's probably coming again. That's what taste response is. It's anticipation. Your body knows that when you bite something twice and chew it up, or drink some, or sip something twice, your body knows the third sip is not far behind from past experience. So your whole biochemistry stops to prepare for it before it happens. So now that I think we adjust a little more, I want you to take a casual sip and see if you like it. Cheers. Cheers. Friday afternoon cheers. Holiday cheers. Yes, holiday cheers. <laughs> now, isn't that more pleasant than the first sip? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Without a doubt. Because your body's not going to all these machinations trying to figure it out. <clears throat> now, this is what's important to me. In the future, going forward, you know, from this time, if you consciously take three sips of any wine, anybody at the end you, with 20 or 30 seconds between the sips, you can always make a clear judgment on whether you like the wine or not. Now, you may decide you don't like it, and that's not wrong. Or you may decide you like it right away. But it really takes three sips to bridge the contrast between your personal chemistry and the wine chemistry.